Fusion Fusion is the sun's source of energy. The heat and light we receive on Earth originate from these fusion reactions. Part of the energy produced remains inside the sun and generates a temperature of 10 million degrees Celsius. This very high temperature, coupled with the gravitational forces and the density of the sun, causes fusion. Under these conditions, hydrogen atoms become separated into their fundamental components, electrons and nuclei, which are then independent of each other and form a new state of matter called plasma. Finally, the nuclei fuse, producing helium and giving off energy. Today, scientists can reproduce this process on Earth. The nuclear fusion process refers to the merger of two light nuclei, hydrogen and hydrogen. This gives an atom of helium. But the two hydrogen nuclei have a positive charge. They don't want to merge. So, we force them. When they're very close to each other, they fuse. And this gives off an enormous amount of energy. How can we force fusion of two nuclei? By using a device to attempt to reproduce conditions in the sun. This is not easy. In the sun, this process requires a temperature of 10 million degrees Celsius. If we were to try to achieve it on the Earth, it would need 150 million degrees Celsius. So how do we do it? I'll show you. We take a glass tube with gas in it and we heat it in a special microwave oven. This is the first essential step to achieve fusion on Earth, heating the gas to a very high temperature by means of an external supply of energy so that it becomes a plasma. I showed you that with a microwave oven, I could heat the gas until the atoms split and become charged particles that consequently emit light. But we cannot reach very high temperatures by this means, because the particles touch the side of the test tube and cool down. So we must develop a system to keep them from touching the tube. To do that we have another experiment using a magnetic field to attract the plasma and prevent it from touching the tube. So this is the second indispensable step, preventing the plasma from dispersing and cooling. In the sun this tendency is counterbalanced by the force of gravity. On earth, confinement by gravity is impossible, so the solution is magnetic confinement. We can confine the plasma, but how can we maintain an enormous quantity of plasma in a reactor? Can we really make it float using a magnetic field? The answer is yes. We can suspend it in the air, where it does not touch anything at all. This too we do in a reactor, but the tool is plasma. And since the plasma does not touch the sides, we can heat it very, very hot. In a reactor, the plasma is confined in a very stable way in a donut shape called a torus. You may think this shape is a strange one, but it's one of the shapes accepted in nature. Let me demonstrate with this box that blows smoke rings when I tap the back. This smoke ring shows how the toroidal shape can be propagated through space without any exchange with the environment. We use the same principle in a fusion reactor. A torus is a very stable shape. If plasma is confined to this shape, we can maintain the heat with no loss to the exterior. On combining all these principles, a fusion device looks like this. This is what is called a tokamak, and this is the inside of the device. But having a device isn't enough. It needs fuel, too. The two elements most susceptible to fusion on Earth are deuterium and tritium, two hydrogen isotopes. Tritium is generated in the device itself using lithium, which is abundant in the Earth's crust. Deuterium is generously present in seawater. In other words, these two resources are practically inexhaustible. This is the first advantage of fusion. Fusion uh, would really help achieve security of energy supply in Europe. The, the resources which are required, the fuel, if you like, for a future fusion power plant, the fuel is available everywhere. And so we would not be uh, dependent on shipments of raw materials or fuels uh, for uh, future uh, fusion power plants. 
Other significant advantages are the fact that the fusion of the two isotopes we see here in plasma form does not result in emitting any gases with a greenhouse effect, that chain reactions and related possible accidents are excluded, and that long-term radioactivity will be very limited. The fuel to operate a fusion power plant consists of hydrogen and lithium. Neither of these is radioactive. The reaction gives helium, which is not radioactive either. But during the reaction, tritium is formed in an intermediary stage. Tritium is radioactive, but if all the tritium in the reactor were to suddenly fly out the chimney, we would not need to evacuate the immediate area. The risk is relatively small. The inside of the reactor becomes radioactive during energy production. As years go by, the inner surfacing must be replaced from time to time. These plates from the inner wall must be stored before they can be reprocessed. This is activated steel whose radioactivity decreases over a period of 50 to 100 years, down to a level that is lower than the ashes from a coal power plant. So this is really very low. Now let's have a look at a concrete example. Europe, the world leader in this field, has already undertaken several research and development projects dealing with fusion. Among these, the JET project for Joint European Taurus, which is the largest tokamak experiment in the world. It was constructed between 1978 and 1983 in Cullum, United Kingdom. Since then, its exploitation was and still is focused on understanding and developing powerful high-performance fusion plasmas as the further step towards fusion power. In 1991, JET was the first project in the world to achieve a significant amount of controlled fusion power, 2 megawatts, with deuterium and tritium. This result was an important event, because it has shown that fusion energy could be produced on Earth. JET has increased this power to 16 megawatts, a world record still unbeaten today. This result paves the way for a larger experimental project like ITER.